Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Lucy Bullivant. I'm a trustee of Temple Bar Trust. And since July 2020, I've curated the Trust's popular online series of talks. And you can see the wealth of talk videos and films that we've created to date on the Trust's website, templebartrust.org. Many of you know that the Trust promotes architecture, urban and landscape design in the square mile to a wide public through a regular program of talks and tours. We are committed to create a culture in which diversity and inequality of opportunity are actively promoted and achieved in the architecture and the built environment professions. And we address these issues as part of our talk series and our related educational initiatives. It will be amazing to finally return to live events at our home Temple Bar on Paternoster Square in May. And we'll be announcing our exciting event plans very soon and which I'm happy to say will include live streaming uh, of talks to ensure that they're fully accessible to anyone who wants to be, be involved. Temple Bar, the architectural gateway to the city, designed by Sir Christopher Wren and managed by the Trust, is also home to uh, our associated worshipful company of chartered architects, of which I am a livery man. That should read also livery person. I always make that joke, but <laughs> we will possibly change that in the near future. So I really look forward to activating this space for in-person uh, events and meetings, dining and uh, entertainment. And you'll also have the opportunity to book our center at Temple Bar for your own events as well. So tonight I'm delighted to welcome our speaker, Femi Arisanya, principal of HOK, the global design, architecture, engineering and planning firm. Hello Femi, very good to have you with us. Good evening. Femi is going to talk about diversity and collaboration in architecture. And these are critical issues he's engaged with in his capacity as principal of HOK, as elected member of council of REBA, and for the last two years as chair of Architects for Change, one of REBA's expert advisory groups, which focuses on equality, diversity and inclusion, EDI in the profession. Femi has over 25 years of architectural experience in the public, institutional, corporate, commercial, residential and hospitality sectors. And since joining HOK in 1999, he's acted as architect and design manager for many prestigious projects, responsible for running them from conception right through to completion. Femi is also honorary visiting professor at the Bartlett School of Architecture, UCL, and a professional examiner at Cambridge University. He takes a very active role in mentoring and supporting students who be, aspire to become architects. So please put your questions for Femi, if you have them in the chat box, and we'll engage with them a little bit later after his talk. We're really looking forward to hearing from Femi. So over to you, Femi, take it away. Uh, thank you, uh, Lucy. Um, can you see my screen? That's my first question. I hope you can. I can see your, your portrait and your credentials and the title. Brilliant, brilliant. So let's, let's, let's begin. So um, when I was uh, asked by, um, by you to, um, to, to, to give a talk um, on things that I'm really passionate about, I decided rather than focusing on one that I will do a whistle stop tour over three, three areas um, tonight. Um, so I'll be talking for about 30, 35 minutes. Um, and I'm gonna touch on diversity. Um, obviously education is quite important and, and then just how we collaborate. Now, what's quite interesting about um, diversity Yes, it's been banded around. We've been talking about it for, for forever, it, it seems, but it, it's not a new concept. Um, and, you know, as, as I've become older and slightly more greyer, it, as I've, I've, I've decided that actually to try and make, um, make quite a lot of noise where I can and, and just try and push it because equity, diversity and inclusion, these are not new concepts. It's, it's not a nice to have. 
And actually, you know, with the Equality Act of 2010, it's actually enshrined in law. Um, but over the last 50 or so years, you know, we, we've been taking two steps forward, maybe one step back. Um, and, and now, I think as we're coming out of the pandemic, this is the great opportunity for us to really try and address this, to try and get diversity across um, all areas of our profession, starting at, at, at the top. Um, and when I talk about the Equality Act, you know, I, I'm sure some of you are aware of these, but, you know, these are protected characteristics that we, we need to take on board when, you know, when we're thinking about these things. And for those of you that don't know, right, the protected characteristics that you cannot discriminate against are age, disability, uh, gender re um, assignation, marriage or, or civil partnership, pregnancy and maternity, race, religion and belief, sex, sexual orientation. Um, and yeah, we, we, we do need to, we need, we need to do more. OK, and the reason why we will need to do more, not only because it's the right thing to do, but actually, if you are diverse as an organization, as a practice, as a profession, everybody wins. You know, the likes of McKenzie write reports ad infinitum as to the benefits of it. And I could go through point by point as to what, you know, what, what the benefits are. Um, but actually, I, I think I'm actually going to just tell a little bit of a story. Um, and this story starts um, in a little place called Missouri 19, in 1955, when this small little firm, their first big project was a little school. Um, and, uh, and what's quite interesting about this, this school project is that it, it brought um, attention to the way in which they were doing things. So much so that a few years later, they were uh, appointed to design this chapel for um, a bunch of monks, uh, Benedictine monks in, in St. Louis, which then won lots of awards. And over the years, they became more diverse in their outlook, not only in terms of their staff numbers, but also in, in terms of the sort of projects that they were looking to do. So they were beginning to become more diverse in the building typologies. And then in the mid eighties, they sort of like arrived in, in, in London and started doing really quite interesting projects. Now, there are some of you out there that will say, oh yeah, yeah, we know this firm. They're, they're, the, um, they're the glass and steel outfit. They do things like, uh, you know, Barclays headquarter building. Um, you know, interestingly enough, they've also done some really quite solid buildings made out of Portland stone in some pretty interesting areas of London, like this one right um, on Grosvenor Place, just across the road from Buckingham Palace. And then at some point, you know, being entrusted to um, renovate and restore some of our nation's most prized assets, like the Ministry of Defence headquarter building, um, spending maybe 15 to 20 years working in various parts of the British Museum, and even designing committee rooms in the Palace of Westminster. And since this talk is actually um, for the Temple Bar Trust, I thought I'd do a little bit of research and just find out how many projects they had um, done within the city of London. And it's, it's quite a few, um, actually. Um, Bow Bells, new building, um, a hospital, um, St. Bartholomew's as part of the uh, Bots in the Royal London um, um, PFI Trust Extension, or even, you know, one of the largest rooftop uh, gardens, um, rooftop terraces in the city of London, working with um, other architects like John Robertson and uh, landscape architects like Steph Sine. Or maybe even bringing together um, a publishing house, Hachette, to a building um, on Victoria Embankment. And then, you know, working on uh, the new HQ for UKRI, that's uh, United Kingdom Research and, and Innovation. And if you haven't guessed who they are by now, um, you'll probably realize it's, it's, it's HOK, who, again, many of you won't know this, but have been working on on the uh, Old Bailey Restoration Plant Renewal Project for coming up to eight years now. And what's quite interesting about HOK is its origins. So you, you have um, George Helmuth, son of an architect. He, um, he, he grew up living and experiencing the peaks and troughs of, of architecture in, in America and the, the benefits or disad and disadvantages of, of cocooning yourself and only working on world, one building typology. And then Gio Obata, um, who 
son of a, a, a Japanese intern who actually managed to avoid uh, being interned in the Second World War because he went to study in, in uh, St. Louis, Missouri. And then George Kassebaum, the businessman, the man who actually would take um, the running of the office and ensure that projects were delivered. And in a way, they became HOK, you know, the marketeer, the designer, uh, the deliverer. Um, and what's quite interesting is how diverse they were from the very beginning. They all met at, at university. And over those years, they then have grown to become um, a, a large practice uh, with, with many offices around the world. But then when you look at, you know, um, HOK London, we're about 150 strong. We've got about 35 different nationalities, about 50 different languages. And that is the strength, the fact that as an, as an organization, it's about diversity and it's about trying to get the best people, no matter where they're from or, or, or what have you. So, yeah, it, it comes naturally. But, you know, the reason it works is because it starts at the top. We talk about leadership, you know, the managing principal who buys into trying um, creating a diverse organization um, who looks to employ the best people no matter where they're from. So it doesn't matter what race you are, what gender, your ethnicity, your um, sexuality, your religion, whether you're neurodiverse, it doesn't really enter the conversation. But what it acts, it's all about, you know, what do you bring to the table? How can you, if you work for HOK, um, bring your best self to work and for you to do your work? Now, what's quite interesting is that our previous president, uh, when, when he retired, he took a couple of years out to, to, to write a book. And, um, you know, he, he kind of said, you know, I want to tell people about um, why HOK is, is so successful. And number one on his list is about the diversity of the people, you know, the skills, the backgrounds, what they bring. Then secondly, making sure that you've got a diversity of typologies that you work to and that you're in different um, sectors and regions. Um, so that's part of it, you know. And I think as we come out of the pandemic, understanding that you've got to be more than just diverse and, um, and, and, and good, but you've also got to be slightly more business minded. You've got to be able to run towards trouble. You've got to be able to work with clients when they have work and when they don't. Um, you know, like George Kassebaum, finding architects who are business savvy. Not everyone is a great, not everyone is a designer. We've got some fantastic designs, but there are some people who see numbers and see that as, as, as design um, and trying to marry those two uh, elements up. And then there are also sort of, you know, general things like making sure that you get paid on time and making sure that you put money away for a rainy day. And, and, and actually, uh, another really important one that we, we were quite grateful of was being right at the forefront of technology. Um, you know, when COVID happened and we had to all shut the office down, we didn't lose a single day. Uh, because we had the infrastructure in place. So, you know, um, that in a way for me, I could have banged on about what we have to do to be a device nation. That's just an example of an organization that is diverse and is continuing to be. Um, about the changing face of architectural education, I was, I was thinking, well, how do I start? And I, and you know, the great fire of um, 1666, everyone remembers it, you know, put in lane. But I wonder whether many people will realize how many houses and churches and livery companies were destroyed as a result of that fire. According to records, there were more than 13,000 houses that were destroyed, 87 churches, 52 livery companies, courts, jails, civil administration buildings. In fact, it pretty much obliterated the, the, the city of London's infrastructure. And so the new act that came in, in uh, the year later, right? First of all, it proposed that all new buildings had to be constructed of brick or stone, trying um, to um, go against the, the perils of fire. It imposed maximum number of stories on the, on the house um, and also fixed number of abodes to try and uh, eliminate overcrowding. And then, you know, interestingly enough, um, the, the, the ancient system of guilds were, was reformed um, as a bit of a clarion call to the carpenters, to bricklayers, to masons, plasterers and joints to help reconstruct the, the city um, into being what it is today. And then 351 years later, we have this, a dark day for 
um, the design and the construction industry. You know, um, systemic, systemic failure pretty much contributing to the needless lives, needless loss of 72 lives. Um, no organization is going to come out of it well, you know. Um, but, you know, it, 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 it's sad. But, you know, with this inquiry that's still going, you know, changes have already started to be made. You know, the Build and Safety Bill is already out. Um, and in a way, it's going to, um, it's already starting to overhaul how tall buildings are going to be designed. Now, that's all going through. Um, if you're really interested, you can get it online. I'm not going to go into that. But what I found was quite interesting in this is that the architectural profession is actually mentioned in the bill. Um, and that is driving the profession to start thinking about how we improve and monitor our levels of competency. Um, and to ensure that from the moment someone decides they want to become an architect till the time they retire, that we are able to continue our professional development. So the RIBA, you know, they've started and they've developed um, the way ahead, which is actually looking to um, really do a root and branch review of architectural education during and, you know, while you're practicing. And um, and also to ensure that, you know, your registration will be tied to mandatory competences, the five year review thing, um, ensuring that the CPD program um, is, is there and enforceable. So, you know, that's all happening. What's also going to happen um, and, you know, young architects or you know, young people already coming through being able to do your CPD and to be able to record it, I think is going to be a, a, a really good thing. The ARB, they're also um, looking at not only um, how architecture is taught, but also the sort of um, how to actually broaden um, the you know the selection of people from our communities to become architects. It's true, it's quite expensive um, to become an architect, which does put off some people. Um, and also trying to ensure that there is a, a, a career that you can do well out of, because there's no point spending five years studying to be in debt and then not to be able to earn from your profession like, like others do. So that's all going through. Um, and, you, and I think in a way, it's the start of something good that could potentially happen. And the reason why we're, we're trying to push this is because as of today, there is a shortage of architects in the United Kingdom, whether it's because of the Brexit factor or the COVID factor. But if we cannot, actually supply architects to help design and deliver buildings, how does our community grow? We know um, the architectural apprenticeship scheme that's been up and running now. There are some universities that have adopted it and fair play, thank you very much. We need more universities to adopt this. Um, you know, I, you'll notice that even Cambridge have, have uh, introduced a program, um, but we need more schools of architecture to, to get on board. We need more employers to join the apprenticeship scheme. In a way, it's a hark. It, we're harking back to the, to the days before um, my profession became a university course where you'd go in and be an apprentice for an architect for a number of years. And then when you finish, you'd be allowed to, um, to, to practice. So that's a different pathway. Um, I know in, in London, there are some of you may also know that, you know, there is another way, um, this new school, the London School of Architecture, which opened in 2015 to provide an alternative route um, to gaining your part two. And, and in a way it's widening access to the profession by trying to make it more affordable, um, always looking for, 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 for funding. And actually I think as of, this week, I, I read that um, 
that the Zaha Foundation, Zaha Hadid Foundation, has just given them a new bursary program for three full-time um, places, which is fantastic. Um, so, you know, the Zaha Foundation, Zaha Hadid Foundation, um, more, more grease to your elbow, as, as they say. But also on top of that, we need architects to be mentors to our assistants and our graduates not just um, when they enter your firm, but maybe at university, because they need to be able to know how to navigate and, and have a kind voice to turn to um, if we really want this profession to grow, we do need to cultivate and you know, look after young designers so that we can make our profession more exciting it's an exciting profession. I love what I do, okay? And if, if we're able to just, if I'm able to sell that to, to youngsters and you're able to sell that to youngsters, then we get the opportunity of getting people that are interested in becoming architects rather than being web designers. Um, I'm not, please don't, I'm not taking this the wrong way that web design is, 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 isn't great, but actually I get to design and, and see what I, I build. And, and I also help to, um, you know, improve um, community uh, um, and, and society as well. So as, as, as I continue, I, I thought I'd just touch on a couple of, couple of projects um, to just demonstrate how with diversity and collaboration and good education, we can actually create really good stuff. So in 1962, um, Francis Crick, James Watson and Morris Wilkins, um, they were awarded the Nobel Prize in physiology um, for their discoveries concerning, and I quote, the molecular structure of nucleic acids and its significance for information transfer in living material. Now, let's not forget Rosalind Franklin in this. She wasn't um, awarded, but it was her work on the X-ray crystallography, which concluded that the DNA was a double um, helix structure. She unfortunately passed away before Nobel Prize was awarded. So in simple terms, right, this was the team that won the race to crack the DNA code, right? The collaborative result of looking at this problem from different perspectives and the serendipitous interaction between this group of extremely clever individuals led to that success. And in a way, that is what the recently completed Francis Crick Institute was designed for collaboration and serendipitous interactions and research to discover new cures for man's illnesses. So I'm actually gonna talk uh, uh, almost, dare I say, at the beginning of the process, you know, the bid team. I, I, was, I was bid manager and, and I always like to start on this particular photograph because this was the team that delivered the winning scheme for, for the project. I think we're about 25 actually. Uh, I know that's probably the size of some some firms, but this was just, the, you know, the bid team, diverse in skill and discipline. We had a project architect. We had an architect that was working on hotels. We had architects who were working on airports, hospitals. We had landscape designers. We had interior designers. We even had a commissioning agent as part of the team. And then you add on top of that, you know, the BIM modeler, the model maker, the graphic designer, all coming together to try and bid for this project because the brief for the Francis Institute, Francis Crick Institute, was to design a state-of-the-art research center of excellence um, that was environmentally friendly and to conduct cutting edge biomedical research, okay? I know this is an old photo. This was taken probably back in 2007 when we had a look, I remember taking this and that's it. So just to the left there is the British Museum and that space now is, is where the Francis Crick stands. Um, and for those of you who, who don't know, sorry, one second. Um, the Francis Crick Institute, again, when we talk about collaboration, it's a joint venture between um, the Medical Research Council Cancer Research UK, the Wellcome Trust, University College London, King's College, Imperial College, and they all came together to create this, 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 this institute that on completion um, would be home to 1,200 of the cleverest scientists in the land. Um, and, um, and as I said, it was just a, an OG project that we, we bid for. Um, and in a way, when we came together as a team, 
we decided that following from from um, Craig Watson and, and Wilkins that we would put together, you know, the ten principles um, for what we believed was the best in collaborative research, which was providing maximum visibility um, and a certain level of uh, density, right, to just allow for those serendipitous interactions, having formal and informal meeting spaces, because sometimes the best work is done away from one's desk. And more importantly, having many different food and drink outlets, because you can't think when you're hungry, right? Um, being able to connect vertically easily, large open plans um, to try and consolidate and uh, to minimize uh, energy use. Putting science on display was another big thing. Um, and then also just creating adaptable spaces. So, you know, I mean, this was the initial um, sketch, which kind of tried to demonstrate all, all those things. And then, you know, um, on the floor above, Again, you can see, um, you know, there's the open plan um, writing space and then inside is the more laboratory driven spaces. And what's actually quite interesting is that the final design um, isn't that far away from the winning scheme. You know, at the front is the, a, a very big public realm, all the public facilities, the big auditorium is, is very close to the entrance, the learning zone uh, where, um, young school children can come in to find out and see science on display and then all the meeting areas um, and then you know the main food foodie places and then obviously you have the back of house places and then you know up up above um this first of all this massive atrium space i think it's about 160 meters long that allows you to actually see from one end of uh, of, of the building to, to the other and then as you rise up through the building um having your write-up space and then you have your lab space and for those of you who are actually interested there was a a, a, a section that that in a way sells the scheme um now also again when we talk about being at the forefront of technology you know, BIM was relatively new in around the 2007, 2008, but HOK were the early adopters and worked quite closely with Autodesk in developing in Revit. Um, and at the time that we were doing this, we created this fully loaded BIM model. I think we remember saying to our clients that we were giving them two buildings for the price of one, one being the, um, the virtual building that was designed um, to ensure that there was minimal clash, um, clashes, and then you know the the, the real one, um, and now it's industry standard. But this project was groundbreaking at that point in time, um, and so there there it was. You know, 2016, it completely um, it completed. And again, when we then talk about collaboration, yes, HOK is down as the architect, but you know we worked with PLP in developing the elevations. Uh, you know, the rest of the design team. You had Arabs who were the PM and the MEP, AKT two structural engineers, Turner and Townsend were the QSs, AV were cordless. We're the environmental consultant at URS, which is now part of AECOM. Um, and, you know, CBRE who worked really hard to get it through planning. And then it was delivered um, by Lang O'Rourke and their own team of, of, of engineers and architects. And at one stage, um, there were over 1,200 people working on this project to create this cathedral of science. And, and yes, you know, we were extremely honored that Her Majesty the Queen opened it in 2016. And there's Sir Paul Nurse there, and there's a picture of uh, uh, Francis Crick just, just to the left. Now, what was quite interesting is uh, uh, to celebrate its fifth anniversary, they were doing some post um occupancy evaluation. And some of the comments that, that actually came from the researchers that were just asked, you know, what do you think of the building? You know, and, you know, what, what we set out to do, which was to try and have this cross-disciplinary research and interaction is exactly how the building is, is, is operating. Um, and, just uh, as you can see here, you know, you've got someone who's writing up their, their results. You've got someone who's doing, um, you know, work in, you know, uh, close by and the proximity um, of allowing them to, 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 to do that. Now, no one would have predicted that COVID would have come around, but this building was completed and, and I, you know, and suddenly it jumped into action. One of the reasons why um, UK PLC were 
were, were the first to come up with a vaccine was probably because of this building and, and, and others. But, you know, it, it pleased me so much. And, and I suppose anyone who worked on it to know that um, the, the Crick was providing a response. And even now that we've got the vaccines, they're still doing um, further research. And, you know, if you look at their website, you'll see the words, we are collaborating, you know. So we as architects, we collaborated to the design this building. The people who are using the building are collaborating every day now to try and better understand, um, you know, coronavirus to ensure that we won't have another lockdown. Um, I'm nearly done. But you know what? Sustainability, COP26, you know, the world, you know, we're killing our planet. Someone like HOK, we've been doing this like forever. And in fact, I, I, and I'm using this image because when I joined, I was given this book, right? And I looked at it, I joined HOK in 1999. And this book, even back then, was on its second edition. You know, the idea of sustainable design is not new. Someone like HOK, and I'm sure there are others, um, have been advocating it before it was even fashionable. Um, and our clients, we design sustainable buildings for them, whether they like it or not, um, because that's our responsibility. And as a result of that, I'm actually going to finish on a, on, a, on a small little project. It's my favorite pet project for the moment because it's only just been completed at the other end of the scale it financially to, to the Francis Crick. Um, it's this little cafe in, in Kew Gardens. Um, now, for those of you that don't know, Kew is in Richmond. It's beautiful. It's 500 acres. Uh, it's a World Heritage Site. There are more than 50,000 living plants on that site. And it has a herbarium that has more than seven and a half million specimens. And some of those specimens date back to Charles Darwin and what he collected on his travels on HMS Beagle. And it isn't just about the plants. Some of the architecture is amazing. You know, um, like the, the, the picture on the left is, um, is Temperate House that was designed by Desmus Barton, um, which I think is down as the largest surviving Victorian glass house in the world, recently refurbished and has just opened. Fantastic. If you get the opportunity, you must go. And then all the others. But we're going to come down to this little project of mine. So it was a glass house right on the edge of um, the children's uh, playground. Um, it had been converted into what was called um, the Climbers and Creepers by Walters and Cohen um, some years back, but it was at the end of its economic life and it was going to cost much more to refurbish than to, to, to build new. Um, and it was decided that that would be the site um, for, for this new cafe. Uh, our brief was quite clear um, that, you know, we needed to increase the number of children that visiting the, the, the site because they built the, the, um, the garden and uh, the, the playground, and they needed something to service that. The existing uh, restaurant was coming also to the end of its, uh, its life. Um, but as part of designing this building, Q wanted to ensure that the children that visited would appreciate and learn about plants and fungi and the natural world, okay? Um, it needed to promote conservation and sustainability. Yes, it's got to make money, so we need to put a cafe in there and, you know, a coffee shop and an ice cream and a retail element. And, oh, yeah, we needed to get over 250 covers, both inside and out. And they wanted a design that they could be really proud of that would um, be Briam excellent and also be climate positive by 2030 because they've signed it, signed up to the agenda. But more importantly, we didn't have much money to do it. It was a really, really tight budget. The previous scheme fell because of affordability issues. So we were part of the Mott McDonald team um, that, uh, you know, came up with, with this scheme. And, you know, when you're walking around and you can't help but look at nature and you look at repetition um, and you know, as we were trying to design, think about how we could design a building that, that met all of the client's um, credentials and um, criteria, you know, you look at something like this, Palm House. Now that was designed also by uh, Desmus Barton, who borrowed technology from shipbuilding to create this, which is one of the reasons why it looks like an uptown ship. But again, you know, units that are repeated. Um, and we thought, well, if they could do it, if the Victorians could do it, then maybe we could. We also had to ensure that um, parents could 
um, watch their children play um, in the playground and if it was raining because children don't understand the concept of it's raining and it's wet that they could have a coffee and and look after their children so you know we located it quite simply by having all of the back of house stuff um, at the back and then maximizing the frontage and views to to the garden um, just very quickly so you can see there in terms of its site plan with the children's playground um, and it, its layout is relatively simple you know a block of um, functions at, at the back that service from the back and then maximizing visibility um, at the front that looks towards the the, um, the playground area and the section again itself is relatively simple um, single story but because we had lots of glaze and we had to think about solar glare, um, trying to minimize solar gain as well. And, um, you know, we had also issues on how it could be constructed. We decided upon trying to create a, um, a, a timber frame building, you know, glue lamb beams, um, cross laminated timber panels. And what was actually quite interesting is that, um, you know, the team that actually worked on this, there was a young graduate whose thesis was a um, was a timber framed airport um, made using these very same the same idea. Um, and then another recently qualified architect whose thesis, whose part two thesis was a tree house, an urban tree house. So just purely again, you know, by luck, by choice, by design, we had individuals in the practice that were really interested in seeing where we could take this timber technology. Um, and it was designed and built off-site, so off-site manufacturing, just like those old glass houses. And once the foundation was down, the whole structure went up in around four weeks. Yes, it needed to be Briam excellent. Uh, we've got a high water table. The, uh, the River Thames is, is only about 150 meters away. And so we couldn't you know, do some of the ground source heating, but we used all the technologies that we possibly could to ensure that uh, we would be hitting that uh, Briam excellent rating. Um, and then we got it to a point and then it went out to tender. Um, and then we just became design guardians to, to, for it to be delivered. Um, what was also quite interesting is that Q wanted to make this a real sort of biophilic kind of space. And they went out and, and um, you know, um, selected Jonathan Mitzi, who, um, drew on Charlie and the Chocolate Factory to try and create this uh, um, botanical science laboratory um, um, building. And I'll show you some images later on. But actually, the contractor that won um, the bid to, to deliver this, um, in the interview, it was fantastic to know that he also was an architect. So an architect who owned a building company who wanted to deliver what was designed to the best of his ability. Um, so, you know, um, city, city access contractor, great firm, we'll work with them again. Um, and then their own architect who, who was the ex, um, executive architect, uh, Moray Architects, um, they then, you know, delivered our, our concept. Um, and it's, it's open, but you know, I think what's grabbing all the headlines at the moment uh, uh, is the interior design concept. As I said earlier, you know, um, Jonathan Mitzi, wonderfully talented young architect. We're going to hear a lot more about him as he uh, as he progresses through the profession. Um, you know, he created this: uh, the apple-shaped seat, the Ethiopian ensert tree, the timber weaved fungi structures that was done by um, a fantastic artist called Tim, Tom Hare. Um, and then, you know, even things like the sculptural honeycomb hive and the cloud shades, all to try and really excite um, children to, to really think about the environment in which they live in. And let's not forget about the retail because that was designed by Lumsden Design. Um, again, making it appealing. Um, for, for, for children and hopefully opening uh, their parents' wallets. Um, so, you know, in a way, I, I'm going to stop now because um, I think I've gone over my, my time a lot, but I just wanted to finish off on why we do what we do and, and why I love what I do and, you know, and why I love working with other architects and in, interior designers is, you know, our sole purpose is, is to deliver um, buildings. Um, we want to be sustainable how we do it, and we want to do it with imagination. 
and it's about using our collective intelligence really to to enrich and improve everyone's lives so um that's me lucy um over to you i'm going to stop sharing now thank you very much femi that was um, amazing wonderful Wonderful. Um, if anyone has any questions for Femi, please do put them in the chat box and we will we will pick up pick up on them and uh, no questions and comments just yet, but uh, please you're very welcome to to put them forward. So Femi, that was that was wonderful. It was such a rich kaleidoscopic, every facet made so interrelated with every other facet. Thank you so much for. Um, beautifully composed, I would say as well, um, and very thought thought provoking. And you, you, Femi, you're naturally very inspiring when you you discuss architecture, because I think you, um, uh, you know, following the actual uh, um, mandate that you've given give, that you've given yourself through the title, diversity and collaboration in architecture, you're presenting a very rounded picture, and um, so we can learn a lot. So let me think, um, the first question I like to put to you out of great curiosity is, you set great store by mentoring. Um, what qualities for anyone watching, what qualities do you think really need to be at the forefront um, of any, in, for anyone who's considering who as an architect, becoming an architectural mentor and secondly where is the mentoring most at need at the moment is it is it for school children or further into further education or every into well, it, this, well every, at every stage but let's deal with let's, like, yeah. yeah let's deal with those who are actually on the journey first okay. and foremost because unfortunately there is a big drop off right from those who start in year one and by the time they get to part three. Um, studies are under underway to try and work out why that is. It could be because of the fact that, you know, um, direction, um, being supported, you know, um, architecture, it's, it's, it is a vocation, you know, just like it, it, you don't wake up in the morning and say, you know, I'm going to do some architecture today. It, it's, it's in you. And so the best mentors are those who really passionately believe that by, by being an architect, they, they're going to improve the society in which we, we, we live in, okay? Helping young people and being there at the end of the phone, you know, the great thing about these last two years is that we've been finding different ways to communicate and, 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 and to mentor. Um, but, you know, looking at, uh, someone's work, maybe just giving them a, a crit, maybe just giving them a pep talk, maybe just telling them that actually, I've been through this. You know, it does it does get better. Or sometimes, you know, being more than just a man, being a guardian, being you know, knowing that you can make a phone call and see if you can help this person. It happens in other areas and walks of life. Architecture, as I said, it's 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 the stuff that, when it works, it really works really well. Um, but unfortunately, the cost, the exposure, the network, or the networking of trying to get someone whose parents or uncles or second cousins are not in the business, you know, how how do they try and break through? Mm -hmm. You know, that's why, you know, at the, at the beginning, I was talking about diversity and, and actually sometimes it's putting yourself out there to say, look, I, I can try my best. But if every practicing architect um, says, you know what, I'm just going to help somebody. Um, I know, you know, where as I sit right now, there are guys and, uh, and, and, you know, my first job, my first job post part one came because the wife of an architect saw me play a game of rugby, right? And didn't know me from Adam, but knew I was studying architecture and thought that, oh, I'm going to give this guy a chance, mm. you know? 
I'm the, and the reason why I'm a mentor is because I'm paying back what someone did to me. You know, if we're talking about karma, mm-hmm. you know, what what goes around comes around. You know, um, someone helped me, I will help someone else. The person I help will help someone else at some point in the future. Right. Yeah? So that's one part of mentoring. The other part is how do we try and attract um, aspiring architects when they're thinking about a career? Going out to schools, you know, um, I was telling you that uh, I was sitting on, on, on council earlier today, even within the RIBA, we're looking at trying to find alternative ways of making architecture more accessible at that critical teenage, 12 to 14 age range, or, you know, when they're busy thinking about, oh, am I going to become an, uh, an accountant, a lawyer, a builder? I, I, I'd love it if someone who did work experience with me um, in an architectural practice, then decided, actually, I don't want to be an architect, but I want to be a QS, or I want to be a builder, or I want to be a plumber, mm-hmm. you know? Um, that's That, for me, if we can get into schools as an architect, interior designer, landscape, um, master planner, even a funder, you know? <laughs> those who fund our projects, those, those uh, you know, who we would call them the others, our patrons, those who actually help allow you and me to do what we do if we can get those young people into schools or get those into schools and tell and tell them what a fantastic um, career you can have by being a member of the built environment Mm. then that would be great it would it would absolutely and uh you know fundamental uh topics as part of mentoring are obviously educated risk-taking uh, that whole process of risk as part of leadership is not necessarily leadership of entire teams, but personal leadership too, and confidence, um, critical judgment, which, uh, you know, honing your critical judgment. Um, there's no end of topics, are there? No, there, there isn't. And you know what, if you're, you know, if as a practice, if there are practices out there that can, um, do what we do at HOK, which is in the summer, we, we take on, you know, um, year 10, 11, 12 um, students mm. to, to come and do work experience. And it's not just about designing, but we try and give them the opportunity to touch on different facets of what we do. So yes, there's a small design exercise. Um, yes, there's some research. Yes, you know, we may teach you how to use a bit of software. But for me, the most critical thing at the end of the week is that they get to present their ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. you know communicating standing up in front of people just Mm -hmm. to talk Mm -hmm. because quite often as I say to people when we go for interviews we've not designed the building yet so what 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 is a potential client basing that emotive response on it's about the chemistry it's about one's ability to 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 communicate and to sell an idea and to be believed Yes, yes, definitely. And it's, uh, it's very refreshing to see that Open City now actually runs courses, short courses in public speaking. Absolutely. So important. And soft skills as well. Mm-hmm. You know, you can be as clever as anybody, but if you don't know how to, to you know, communicate, present, to have the soft skills, it, it limits you. So that's another thing that I think we we need to try and work on with with our young people, especially those that may not have the opportunity at at school. Um, We we, we have to try and supplement that. Yes, and you're doing you're doing really groundbreaking work in this field. So second question is you're a firm believer that architecture should be open to everyone. Yes. And that changing things from the inside is the chief answer. And I was reading your Reba blog um, from a little while ago where you, you, ma- you made the statement, so we cannot fully understand, appreciate and design for com- the communities that we serve mm. if we do not employ a culturally diverse workforce. We cannot believe, uh, sorry, we cannot continue to believe that the status quo is good enough. Now, there's been a huge um, uh, array of different discussions about inclusivity and diversity and, uh, and arguably really, really good progress lately, but there's also a huge amount, uh, a huge way to go. What would you like to say 
um, to elaborate on that statement and uh, what, what do you see as being the key steps from here on in? Two-part question again. Okay, so, you know, when all this was really kicking off, we were, we were working from home and, you know, people saying, yes, we're going to do this and, you know, it's going to happen. Well, now's the time, you know. Last, a couple of days ago, the Prime Minister said COVID is over. Okay, um, we're all getting back to normal. Let's see if we if we if let, let's let's deliver on our promises. You know, I believe that the community in which I live, London, the UK, is is London definitely is probably the most diverse city in the world. Mm. Okay, and we are so much further along than than other societies, but we've got a long way to go. Okay, if for no other reason. Being diverse, being a diverse organization will improve the bottom line because it is a byproduct. You know, we don't we don't go there just to make money, right? It's about delivering great work. Imagine having a client that understands where you're coming from. When they come into your office, they look around and they see a diverse organization. Okay. They know that we are designing for their users. So for me, I think as we move forward, let's have a look at the top practices. How diverse is their leadership? Have they taken on board um, some of the criticisms that have been labeled against them? Have they said, actually, we are going to change this? Yeah. Are we going to have um, a board that, that, is, that has gender parity? Is it going to have people from from the ethnic minorities? Not just because they're an ethnic minority. And by the way, you know, I'm I'm very much of the opinion you need to be good enough to be in there. But give someone the opportunity, okay? And if you make that decision to employ someone, then support them, okay? Don't just say, well, we've we, you know we've ticked the box and uh, it hasn't worked, so we're never going to do it again. You know, support people. I can honestly say, and I've been at HOK for 23 years. I joined HOK back in 1999, and I was going to be there for two years, get them on my CV, you know, say I've worked for the top one, and then move to the next one. Um, that was my original plan. You know, obviously, I'm not very good at keeping plans because I've been there 23 years. But why have I been there? So I'm going to talk about myself. Why have I been there for 23 years? Because they appreciated what I did, because they mentored and then they promoted and they recognized what I was doing yeah that empowered me to build a big team to do fantastic work that team is also now diverse and it just perpetuates because it's it's you know if it's a good feeling of coming into the office in the morning and you know that you're bringing your best self to work whether you're black white straight gay um, disabled, um, you know, we have to work with it. Don't get me wrong. You know, we're not perfect, but you know, if there is an issue, it gets dealt with. You know, do you know? Now that we're coming back, have we ensured that there's a prayer room so that you know my Muslim colleagues can pray at, 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 at lunchtime? You know, is there somewhere where you know a, a nursing mother can go and express milk without making it a big deal? Have we, have, have we provided for the person who needs reasonable adjustment? Do we have a space where someone who's slightly, who's neurodiverse um, doesn't want to be in a big space? Yeah, and it just happens, you know? Because as I said at the beginning, it happens at the top, you know? The organization from the very top is saying we are, you know, my managing principal is an advocate. I don't, you know, I'm pushing at an open door, right? which then allows everyone else to, to try and do good work. That's just, you know, and that's the reason. That's, that's the reason why there are, I've got colleagues uh, who've been part of HOK in excess of 15 years, you know. We have CVs coming through every day. And quite often, you know, we're always saying, okay, Karin, you know, you, you studied architecture, but do you fit our organization? Are you someone, are you going to buy into being as, you know, as being someone as part of the HOK family? And I know I'm sounding like a, um, someone who's like, a, you know, 
um, an evangelist. I'm not, right? I'm an architect who loves rugby, but I also enjoy coming into work and working with my friends and colleagues because we all have the same ideal. It's fine. You can be an evangelist, but be my guest. I really appreciate that. <laughs> I mean, it's absolutely about, about empathy, emotional and creative intelligence plus action, is it, is it not? So, it's about the action. It is very much about the action because, you know, words are cheap. You know, yes. and, and coming back to you, what you've said earlier, yeah, a lot of people put a lot of words out there. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. now it's about the action. So addressing the second part of my question, uh, I'm picking up on um, age, the Architects for Change um, expert advisory group at REBA. What, what are your members, you and your members, most engaged with right now? And what do you want to achieve in the next two couple of years? We want to become the exemplar profession in the built environment for equity, diversity and inclusion. In the same way that the RIBA plan of works is the standard for designing and delivering buildings, mm -hmm. we within the Architects for Change are pushing to put in place um, you know, strategies, papers on how to be an inclusive employer, you know. Um, we recently, or well, it's a year now that, um, and after many years of, of trying, we got our first director of, of, of inclusion. Um, and, you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm an architect, I design for a living. As much as I'm passionate about this, you need someone who is a professional. So, you know, Marsha, is working at um, developing the strategy on, on behalf of Reba, and we support her in that. Um, so, I, you know, I'm not going to say, right, she's there and I'm going to back away because actually I, I, I want to see the action. I want to see where we're, where we're going for it. We all know, you know, the RIBA over the last few years, they've had some pretty bad press, let's be honest. You know, they probably didn't um, deal with issues that they should have. Um, but, you know, the RIBA is just like community. We've got some good people. We've got some bad people. Yeah. The point is that we want to get more good people to, 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 to silence out the bad. And that's what the RIBA is trying to do. Um, I'm bought into it. It's going to be a hard journey. Don't get me wrong. You know, it's been around since 1834. Um, you know, um, I'm not quite sure when the first um, female architect was, was, was admitted. I should know, but I don't know. But, you know, it, it, it's, it's moving. And um, and we we've had we we've had women presidents, so you know I think we 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 we're, we're now um, we've got Simon Alford who's our current president, and he's trying to make change. Again, he you know despite what people may think, he's an advocate and he's pushing it. You know, as he tells me, he's a working class lad from Sheffield. Yeah, he's done good, boy, done good. You know, so again, it's, it's about him trying to give back to, to, to his profession. Mm. Tremend tremendous. So another question, which is um, about the financial models of becoming an architect. So Satwinder Samra, who's director of collaborative practice at Sheffield University, um, talking about Sheffield, mm -hmm. He, last year in a very interesting article that was published in Architects Journal um, about diversifying the profession and roots in and through, roots in and through, architectural education is long, arduous and expensive. Often this means only those with means and access to financial support will succeed. I would suggest, he said, that we place more em emphasis on earn as you learn type models to democratize the profession. What do you what do you think about Satwinder's idea? Well, the London School of Architecture is a typical example of that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yes, there needs to be other pathways to becoming registered. So, yeah, I, I don't have a problem with that. You know, I came through the traditional route. Now, I'm a working class lad. OK, and I know the times were different, but, you know, I worked during term time. Um, you know, I studied full time. I worked during the recesses, I paid off my overdraft, went back to study. Um, and I didn't have a silver spoon in my mouth. So I understand 
you know how difficult it was even for me back back then some people say that could we make the course um quicker should we make it shorter they try to make this comparison between medicine and 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 and, and what we do well to the best of my knowledge um the human race is just one body right you know we as architects you end up learning much more than just how to design a house you've got many different typologies of like so you've got to you've got to go through that process of understanding not only how to design but to detail and then to manage and to construct um there are models already out there cardiff the Walsh school of architecture where i studied they did a five-year uh, part um parts one and two degree where your fourth year you're working um so, you know, you end up doing three years of work experience before you do your part three. That model's already out there. You've got other models now. You've got the apprenticeship um, scheme. So, yes, I agree with, with, with him. Um, it depends on the person who wants to, to do it and, and how they want to do it. If you really want to be an architect badly enough, you will find a way. I agree. I totally agree with you, Femi. Um... Sorry, and just also just one more thing as 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 you were yeah. talking. So and then you know, there are those and I there are um individuals in, in, in our office who are studying full time, um, but because they came to us as part ones, um they get to work 20 hours a week and they fit their studies in around the work. And there are other firms I know out there that try to do this because we you know, there's no, every architect, unless you, you know, you, you're privileged, would have gone through some level of hardship. Mm. Well, I, what we do need to make sure, though, is that architectural practices should not be exploiting students working for free. Mm. Mm. Okay. And if any chartered practice does that, I'm quite clear that they should no longer be called a chartered practice. OK, the only problem that we have is that there are firms out there who say they offer architectural services, but they're not chartered. And then they do something that's not um, in line with the charter and they give the rest of the profession a bad name. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dead right. So um, talking about your wonderful Francis Crick Centre and the equally wonderful Small is beautiful. Centre at Kew Gardens. They're both they're both fascinating stories. Um, I, I was lucky to go enough to get go to Francis Crick to have both my first two jabs. Actually, oh, fantastic. Uh, I appreciated the actual scale and spatiality in the interior for the first time. What would you say you'd learn from Francis Crick, which has got a fantastic backstory, the cultural, scientific kind of um inspiration and uh, model for the building and getting feedback from the users what what do you think would some of the the main thing that you would take away in terms of the learning from the collaborative process of making francis crick um and, and uh, or and or what were the biggest challenge challenges that you had to overcome from which you would learn of course yeah well, again, it's, you know, getting the brief right, even though, the, the you know, the idea is was what that's what we wanted to create, but it was getting the brief right and trying to ensure that you created spaces for the researchers that was at the top. You know, it created a new benchmark um, because, interestingly enough, there's a lot of competition for the cleverest people. <laughs> so, you know, the Crick at the time, you know, the other institutes that were up and going, and it was decided that in order to try and get the best brains, you needed to give them the best kit, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, and again, this a whole argument of capital expenditure versus revenue expenditure, ensuring that you spend the the money to create the best that you possibly can to ensure that you have um, adaptability and flexibility because science is always changing. So having that template, 
and you know some of the spaces which are, you know most people don't get into but if there is another demand for something that they can quickly adapt um, a floor plate you know where we had the research the writing up space and the research space that actually could ebb and flow if you needed to make um, one area bigger or, or smaller. So flexibility was a was a very big component of 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 of, of the crick. Um, and as I said, you know, visibility. We we then were fortunate enough um, as that was working its way through. We were then appointed to deliver. Um, two projects, one in Glasgow, the Glasgow Innovation Hub, based on the same ideas, a considerably smaller project, but using the same things that we'd learned from, from the CRIC. And then um, uh, at Cardiff University, the Translational Research Facility, again, another similar type of project. But also what's also quite interesting is that, you know, cross-fertilizing ideas from the different um, building typologies that we've worked on over the years almost to create a new building typology. That's another thing which I think that we've, we've used and repeated again. Um, I think I said at the beginning, you know, it wasn't just guys that had designed science buildings that worked on this bid. We had chaps that had worked on hotels who understood how the front of house should work. We had individuals that had worked on airports and understood the logistics, you know. That, that's where the, the, you know, when you're creating something new, because What's, what's that phrase? It's either evolution or revolution, um, you know? But mm. innovation sometimes comes by just changing maybe something just ever so slightly or looking at it from a different angle, mm -hmm. yeah? Mm -hmm. And then you then come up with a new typology and a new way of doing, a better way of, of, of doing things and being open to, to the ideas of your peers. Yes, and uh, that is just uh, so absolutely on... Uh, you know, so appropriate to this kind of wisdom about how to be as creatively um, active and present in that type of process when you're making essentially a new typo a new typology. I mean, obviously there has been science institutions for for many decades, but uh, um, just talking to people who are um, working on med tech hubs, for example, I, I'm acutely aware of uh, all those issues uh, about what you feed, how you feed in the ideas and how you, you interface with other people's ideas to come up, people with such a diversity of backgrounds. And, it, you know, yeah, and, you know, just as you were talking there, you know, ensuring that uh, all of the coffee and tea making places were centrally located so if you did want to have a break you had no choice you had to leave your desk mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. maybe to have that serendipitous interaction that conversation you know what are you working on working on this you know that's that's where you that's where that's you know when when you can get things really working well fantastic well the uh, the principles and the values that you you adhere to are um, uh, numerous, interconnected, and and really inspiring. And we're going to have to wrap up now. But I honestly do think that um, the two two examples of the two projects you've discussed. There's such a lot that architects can take away from uh, the the approach that you've taken and uh, and use that in their own in their own, to support their own um, uh, thinking and practice. Okay. We've, covered, we've covered a lot of ground. It's uh, like everything, everything that you've, you've, you've talked about is actually really critical to discuss. So thank you so much, Femi, for putting this, this beautifully composed talk together for us and engaging in the, in the topic. Um, serendipitous interactions. We hope there will be many more of those uh, in the near future and uh, Temple Bar, we hope to welcome you at Temple Bar and Paternoster Square from May onwards and uh, hopefully you can join us and take part in a dis future discussion in person as well. Oh, but thank we, you. I'd look forward do, to it. Obviously, we think that online talks are going to continue in perpetuity and uh, there's been so much 
um, that's been advantageous that we've all gained from them. So thanks again, Femi. I think I'm going to flag up the fact that our next talk is on the 17th of March. We've got Nikki Gorick, the fine art photographer, and she's going to present her exploratory photography of a whole range of um, churches across the square mile, which she has um, navigated St. Paul's Cathedral and over 40 other Anglican churches, plus Jewish, Dutch, Catholic and Welsh places of worships. Worship conveying a very vibrant, diverse spiritual life of goings on and charismatic personalities within London's financial centre. So more details of the talks that we are planning will be on the Temple Bar Trust website and publicised on social media. So watch those spaces and we will let you know what we're up to and hopefully you can join us. So thank you to, very much to our audience and thanks again so much, Femi. It was really, really, um, your sage wisdom is uh, really a credit and we are all going to, be, we are all going to continue benefiting from it. So let's see more mentoring in architecture for one, one thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot and uh, good night. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.